Chapter 7. Eluding the Meeting Minds Avoid the Pitfalls of Counterproductive Meetings Everyone who has come out of corporate America recalls different highlights of the experience, but without exception, all of them recall the endless meetings. Many managers, who still have some desire to be productive, get extremely frustrated with the meeting syndrome. They are absolutely convinced nothing of value ever happens in meetings. The greater the attendance at the meeting, the less productive it seems to be. Meetings can be great obstacles for workers who are results-oriented. There has been a deluge of displaced executives flocking into the network distribution industry. They bring with them some valuable resources, most notably their wide base of professional contacts and high-level management experience. But they also bring some disastrous habits, many of which may have caused the downsizing of corporate America in the first place. We will discuss this in more detail in Chapter 9. That same executive who was paid a fairly high salary to go from meeting to meeting in his former career has a strong inclination to carry that habit into our industry. In the very first year of network marketing, probably even the first month, new distributors may find themselves exposed to one of the prime causes of failure in our profession, lethargy. Because this is brought on by the very people whom they regard as successful, it will be difficult to resist. Lethargy results from what we call meeting minds. In the battle for success, these minds seldom cause death, outright failure, but they often lead to the maiming and disfigurement of a networking career. That is, they keep some new associates from rising to their full potential. Once they step on these well-camouflaged explosives, new distributors may end up disabled and limping through the rest of their careers. If new distributors are lucky, they will be able to avoid these particularly destructive explosives until after they have achieved a reasonable income. Those unfortunate enough to be led through this minefield by their sponsors in their first month may indeed be among the earliest of our dearly departed associates. Although meeting minds usually just maim, they can be fatal. Take some time to consider how our industry works. Income is paid when products or services are ordered. The larger our organization, the more orders are placed. CEOs in our industry pay people to do word-of-mouth advertising instead of building overpriced retail stores and hiring expensive public relation agencies. The more people we personally recruit and train, the larger our organization and the larger our income. Therefore, effective recruiting and training meetings are the foundation of our business. In network marketing, no one pays you to waste time sitting around in strategy meetings. Unless you are talking to people about your business, you are not really working the business. New distributors will never be as enthusiastic about personal sponsoring as they are in the first year. It is the most critical time in the career of a network marketer. In this chapter, we intend to describe meeting minds carefully and provide you with an effective defense against each of them. First Mine – Hotel Meetings just about the time a new distributor has learned how to become a leader and has his group on track, some out-of-town leader inevitably blasts into the community and holds a citywide hotel meeting. Although lavish and appealing to new people, it can often result in teaching your group bad habits. Or it may be a regularly scheduled hotel recruiting meeting at which one or two of the local leaders speak and to which you are encouraged to bring new recruits. Such meetings are going on at all hours of the day at every major hotel in the world. Occasionally, the speaker is reasonably good, and lots of distributors are encouraged to attend. As many as a thousand people can be present. But of all the ways to build a dynamic network marketing organization, a large hotel meeting as the first and primary contact with your prospects is perhaps the very worst. In spite of the fact that Mark's mentor, Richard Call, said, Don't do a hotel meeting when I make my first trip to Austin. Mark set one up anyway. He packed 300 people in a ballroom, convinced that, given his communication skills, Richard's success, and a ground-floor networking offer, they'd sign up half the audience. 
Mark sat up all night putting his identification number on more than 100 distributor agreements. Out of the 300 prospects, only three signed up, and all of those had quit in 60 days. Mark had just stepped on his first meeting mine and resolved to never do it again. Hotel meetings were first developed by network marketing companies that sold durable goods as a means of quickly sifting through large numbers of people in order to find one or two people with big money to invest. A former president of one such company told us jokingly that their best closers used this method to sniff out overly eager prospects with at least $30,000 to invest. The problem is, when these companies were run out of business or prevented from front-end loading distributors with garages full of products, their hotel meeting system remained popular. But hotel meetings are among the least effective recruiting systems. Network marketing has always been a people business. When prospects are subjected to a large, impersonal meeting room, the intimacy of our business is completely lost. Long before fax machines, computers, VCRs, and hotel meetings, Mary Kay created more female millionaires than any other corporation in history. Amway built a billion-dollar empire in America using private in-home meetings and is today still four times larger than their nearest competitors. For some strange reason, during the last half of the 80s, when MLM really began to blossom, most companies opted for hotel meetings rather than in-home meetings. Hotel meetings can only be of value if they are used occasionally as a supplement to regularly scheduled in-home presentations. Let's analyze why. Hotel meetings cannot be duplicated. First, the setting of a hotel meeting is all wrong for network marketing. The number one fear in business is public speaking. New prospects whose first introduction to our business is via the hotel meeting will be immediately fearful of success. They walk into the Hyatt, see a well-dressed couple addressing hundreds of attendees with a microphone and think, I can't do that. Most people fear public speaking. We sometimes wonder how many millions of would-be successful MLM distributors have walked out of hotel meetings and chosen never to participate because they thought they might be required to stand up and deliver a public speech. The thought can be quite intimidating. No one need ever deliver a speech to become a millionaire in our profession. Yet that's not the understanding of many who quit before they ever begin, believing that public speaking is a large part of network marketing. In addition, there's the money issue. It costs a reasonable sum for leaders to rent a ballroom or a meeting space at a hotel. So at the meeting, either the leaders lose money, which most can't afford, or they make a profit, which encourages others to emulate them. But what about the message that is sent to prospects and other members of the group as they glance around the room and discover, with simple mathematics, that the leader is making money off them? There will be some resentment at the thought of a leader profiting from the meeting. Moreover, some entrepreneurial leaders will get the idea that the way to make money in network marketing is to conduct these large meetings. Other leaders even go further by selling books and tapes to participants. It can become so profitable that one leader, formerly with one of the biggest MLM companies, confided in us he can gross over a half million dollars in a weekend by charging for hotel rooms, food, books, tapes, CD-ROMs, etc. However, he has the advantage of being a professional convention planner with plenty of money to invest. Not every leader has the resources to duplicate that approach, nor should he or she really need to have them. The nature of our business is to earn money from the sale of products and services, not peripheral materials. Hotel meetings create dependency. Network marketing is successful when leaders are recruited who, in turn, recruit other leaders. It is meant to create independence. Many companies insist on the use of the term independent distributor. Yet, hotel meetings have just the opposite effect. For those who do join and buy into the concept, they think, Great! I don't have to work to be successful. All i got to do is send my friends, family, and associates to the Hyatt each Thursday night, and these great speakers will do it all for me. 
Of course, that never works, because ultimately the only people who make real money in MLM, with very few exceptions, are those who conduct their own meetings. Effective recruiting meetings need not be large, and no one needs to deliver formal speeches. Attending meetings at hotels should not be confused with real work in this business. Too many new distributors find that it's much easier to become professional meeting attendees than it is to face the rejection of frontline recruiting. At the outset of your MLM career, it is important to understand that sole dependence on hotel meetings for recruiting and building a large organization is based on an erroneous principle. This is easy. I don't have to work. I'll just send people to meetings. Absolutely not true. A low turnout causes embarrassment. If you think no-shows are hard to take when the meeting is held in your home, think about how you might feel when this happens at a hotel meeting. There is no worse experience in this business than to rent a hotel room and have a handful of people show up. Ask any leader in the business. Almost everyone has been there and done that at least once. Dave Johnson recalls one such moment in his first year of the business, nearly ten years ago. Early in my career, I felt it necessary to grab at any chance I had to talk to people in hopes that they may join somewhere in my line. One of my second-level distributors, Dr. Hung Tai Wang, invited me to conduct a training meeting in Bethesda, Maryland at the Hyatt Regency. He promised me that there would be 175 people in attendance. So I maxed out my credit card, cashed in my last three miles on United, and went to support my downline. On the target Saturday, I arrived at the ballroom at 8.30 a.m., one hour before the 9.30 start time. Nobody was there. At 9 o'clock, Dr. Wang arrived. At 9.15, it was still just the two of us. At 9.25, there were five guests. By 9.30... Dr. Wang was pacing up and down the hallway, looking for lost distributors. At 9.45, he was quite distraught, wondering where the other 170 guests were. We did conduct the all-day seminar for the five attendees, and three of them are still in the business today. However, Dr. Wang admitted later that he wished the overhanging chandelier would have fallen on him and ended it all right there. The moral for me was the realization that you never know when you'll meet your next top leaders. Just think of what could have happened to those three leaders if we had discounted their attendance and canceled the seminar because of lack of expected attendance. The fact is that the meeting could have been held in Dr. Wang's home and spared him the embarrassment of all the no-shows. They were extremely lucky they didn't come away with nothing to show for their efforts. Of the countless stories we've heard over the years, no one else in this entire industry has described a similar hotel experience with such a positive outcome. Today, Dr. Hung Tai Wang has one of the largest organizations in Asia and is one of the highest-paid distributors in the business. Dave Johnson and his wife Connie live in Reno, Nevada, the same town in which we live. Renee worked closely with them during those pioneering days, and we have all become close friends. As upline to Dr. Wang, the Johnsons are the leaders of one of the largest Asian organizations and among the highest-paid distributors in our company. They travel extensively and live a life that others can only dream about. Paula Cook Ehrlich tells a similar story of her early days in the business when she accompanied her husband on a business trip to Texas. While there, I decided to hold an opportunity meeting for a few people we knew. I was planning to use our hotel suite for the meeting and had taken a few key products with me to show everyone. I happened to mention this to my upline, and he said that he had a very large organization in Texas and that he would put out a voicemail about the meeting. He said that I should get a meeting room at the hotel, which I did, for about 50 people. I called him when I'd done this, and he said that he didn't think the room would be large enough that I should get one that would accommodate about 100 people. That was two days before the meeting, and at that point the only room the hotel had available was one for about 200 people. So we decided to rent it, setting up water stations at the back and a large product display at the front to take up any extra space. Of course, then I had to have more products and display materials than I brought with me, so I had the company send, via overnight courier, 
a complete product package, and then scurried about town to find what I needed for the display. When I reported back to my upline, he said he'd put the message out a couple of times on voicemail and that we should have a good crowd. He added that this would be great training for me. He was right. I just had no idea how costly the lesson would be. Well, the evening of the big event came, and we had the most beautiful product display and professional handouts on each chair, summarizing the business opportunity and products. Two of my associates had come early to handle the registration desk. But only 15 minutes before we were scheduled to start, no one had shown up. At that point, we said to each other, Wouldn't it be funny if no one came? Ha <laughs> ha. Well, guess what? By our scheduled start time of 7.30 p.m., there were four people in the room, and they were four of the original ten I had invited, in a room that would hold 200. We did sponsor those four guests, so it wasn't a total loss, just a very expensive evening. They must have gotten a clear picture that the market wasn't saturated yet. My husband jokingly said that if there was any scam in this business, it was that my upline had a downline in Houston. We had a good laugh over it. When I got back to my room, there was a message from my upline asking me to call him and let him know how the meeting went. When I told him, he was horrified, and I will never forget his first question to me. Are you going to quit? To tell you the truth, it never even entered my mind to quit. When I told him, no, of course not, he said that I had real character. If I wasn't planning to quit, then I would definitely make it in the business. As it turned out, there was a glitch in the voicemail system preventing anyone from hearing the announcements. My upline offered to pay for the room, which I declined, but we've had many laughs over it since. In the years that followed, I thought of that comment often when I really did feel like quitting. It kept me going. Today, seven years later, Paula and her husband Mort are living on Miami Beach, having reached the very pinnacle of their company, drawing an income from an organization that stretches across more than 20 countries. They are living the lifestyle of which they've always dreamed and still believe that anyone can do this business if they are willing to overcome the temporary setbacks along the way. A handful of people showing up in a home or a hotel suite would have been a normal MLM gathering but a handful in a hotel ballroom is not a good feeling if you are the host. It's also quite costly. Most networkers can only afford to make this mistake once. Hotel meetings are not private. Hotel meetings, by their very nature, systematically screen out 25% of the population. Just use a little common sense. Many doctors and accountants cannot afford to be seen by patients or clients at a hotel recruiting meeting for multi-level marketing. Many corporate leaders and company owners won't risk being seen in these meetings by their subordinates or customers. Teachers fear bumping into parents of their students, or even worse, their principal. We once recruited a pediatric cardiologist who sat in our living room and said, you know, my own sister tried to get me to attend one of her meetings when some great out-of-town leader was speaking in Austin, but I declined. How confident would the parents of a five-year-old be if they bumped into their physician at an MLM recruiting meeting the night before he was to perform open-heart surgery on their child? The only reason I'm here now is because it's a private meeting. Remember, the first time a new prospect sees our business, the best possible setting is your living room be it ever so humble. Hotel meetings do not exemplify freedom. We are always insisting to new prospects that freedom is our greatest reward. So imagine a guy on Thursday night at 7.30, loosening his tie and walking into a meeting of a hundred people. He's thinking about the fact that he's already put in 42 hours this week at his company. How is he going to explain to his wife and children why, he now needs to go out to meetings at night, too. Nobody wants to spend what precious little time they've got at night searching for a parking space at the Hilton. Large weekly hotel meetings destroy the concept of freedom by forcing people to add to their already overloaded schedule after their regular work hours. 
Hotel meetings create an illusion of saturation. It's impossible to saturate any area with too many distributors. Yet the perception of saturation can discourage new distributors. A presentation is naturally more appealing when it is given in one's living room with a few friends discussing the tremendous ground floor opportunity in network marketing. We all know that, relative to the entire population of most cities, a gathering of 300 people is a drop in the bucket. Yet to new distributors, it may seem as if everyone in their immediate area already knows about this deal. A new distributor may think, "My gosh, in this room alone, two hundred ninety-nine people are ahead of me in this business." The impression of joining a company at an early stage is destroyed by the initial perception of hundreds streaming into a large hotel recruiting meeting. Hotel meetings do not promote personal development. Personal growth and development have always been the true assets of our industry. But only a very few people experience personal growth by standing up in front of an audience with a microphone. For most people, leadership skills are better developed in small in-home meetings to recruit new frontline distributors, coupled with weekend training sessions in which networkers are taught to lead their own small groups. We believe the most positive outcome of success in our industry is not financial independence or time freedom. But rather personal development. We have proudly watched many of our personal recruits, some of them the most unlikely to become success stories, develop into remarkable leaders by sheer force of will. Rather than conducting their recruiting meetings for them, we encouraged them to take charge on their own. And while some successful leaders are proud of the former doctors, lawyers, and corporate CEOs they've sponsored. We are exceptionally proud of our humble frontline recruits, a housekeeper, a student, and a police officer, all of whom have become millionaire legends in our industry. Along the way, we managed to recruit a few dynamic professionals like Terry and Tom Hill, but for the most part, our highest percentage of successful frontline leaders were formerly ordinary wage earning people. The message we want to convey at every meeting with every single prospect and distributor is a simple one: We are in a low investment, low overhead distribution business in which average people can achieve wealth and independence through hard work and the legitimate movement of products and services. Here's the message we don't want to convey: We are in a pyramid system in which those with public speaking skills who get in early. Can lead profitable weekly, monthly, and annual meetings by selling books and tapes and hosting motivation rallies. The latter message is the one being projected by those who insist on regular hotel meetings. Thus, the first meeting mine a new distributor is likely to encounter in the early battle for success is the frequent hotel extravaganza. Hotel meetings are not an effective tool in building a legitimate network. And they are not easily duplicated by the masses. Hotel meetings are a great way to bring your group together periodically on special occasions, like when upline leaders in your group come to town, or for a formal presentation of awards or a special recognition, or just for bonding. But most of your time should be spent in face-to-face -face prospecting or at home making calls and doing your own presentations. Second mine. The part-time adult daycare center. The second meeting mine actually occurs most often in the home. We call it the part-time adult daycare center. Generally, it's created by well-intentioned upline leaders who open their homes to any and all downline associates whenever they are not at work. New people and old feel they can drop by any time to pick up products or just have a cup of coffee and visit their upline. It's a bit of an ego boost for those who have never had many friends, and it's a wonderful way to improve one's social life. It's also much easier to coach existing distributors who respect you than it is to endure the rejection of recruiting meetings with new prospects. The problem is, if your goal is to build a large organization, this method won't help you. It's like having a 24-hour drop-in center for the homeless, and is about as profitable. 
This socializing may be fun, but don't deceive yourself into believing that your daily or weekly drop-ins are productive or helping grow your business. They aren't. Third mine, the church service. Another less effective get-together is what we call the church service. Generally, it's a weekly recruiting meeting in which frontline distributors bring guests to the leader's home for a presentation. If these meetings really worked, they would render themselves obsolete in a matter of days. Here's why. If in the first week five people come to a recruiting meeting and everyone duplicates the process, by week three there should be 155 prospects. The original five, their 25, and their 125 altogether. Most homes won't comfortably seat that many. And even if they do, by week four, they certainly can't handle 780 folks. Obviously, the reason some leaders can continue to do weekly in-home meetings for their downline for years is that the group doesn't grow exponentially. If your goal is to build a close circle of friends for the purpose of weekly personal support, or if you merely wish to have a small group of individuals who look up to you, there's no better way than the weekly MLM support group. It's great for folks who don't have a church affiliation, but need weekly two-hour bonding sessions with a group of like-minded people. But it's no way to build an international network marketing organization. If the exponential growth were to work as it should, besides having a totally unmanageable number of people, leaders would soon find that they had created a destructive codependency. If you wish to earn a great deal of money and achieve total control of your time and destiny, you must become a leader and conduct your own meetings while teaching your front line to do the same. Renee shares her own personal experience from before we were married with this type of gathering in Reno. As a former nun, I earned the right to conduct weekly church services. It was in my nature to enjoy conducting them, and I believed at the time that I was doing a great service for my downline. I am a teacher at heart, and I loved presenting the business opportunity to our new prospects. I was going to be holding them anyway for my own prospects. Why not do them for my distributors as well? Many of the more self-sufficient in my group did branch out with their own home meetings, but once a week on Tuesday evenings I had thirty to forty people gathered together, both distributors and their prospects. As long as I continued leading them, many good things came from those meetings. New people joined us in the business, but it was the closeness and friendships that we built that I really treasured. At the end of 1991, Mark and I married. My life changed dramatically, including considerable travel with my husband to support his, now our, downline across the country. I gave up my weekly meetings, and almost overnight my Reno group disintegrated. Partly it was due to the fact that our company was experiencing the most severe media scrutiny in the history of network marketing, but mostly it was because I had made most everyone in the group dependent on me. When I closed the church doors, it shut down business for many of my associates. It was a hard but important lesson for me. If you are holding your own church service by choice, at the very least, Continue to encourage the independence of every single person in your group along the way. It is important for their own personal growth and for the growth of everyone's business. Fourth Mine The Deception Meeting The next meeting mine is called a lot of different names by a lot of different marketers. Some call it the dinner meeting because it usually involves friends who have been invited to a dinner party. Others call it the curiosity meeting because the approach used to get friends and associates to the house does not explain why they're invited, so the friends attend because they are curious to see what their hosts are up to. Actually, we call it the deception meeting because those of us who were ever invited to one still remember how angry we were at our friends for leading us on. In fact, many of us avoided network marketing for years because our only exposure to the industry involved this kind of trickery. Before you use this kind of meeting to snare recruits, be forewarned that it is not only ineffective, but it can lead to real resentment among friends. The deception meeting is based on a very serious misconception. 
Some distributors with companies that have been in business for over a decade are afraid to tell their friends the name of their company out of fear that a well known name will lead them to believe that the market is already saturated with distributors and therefore won't be inclined to come to a presentation. This fear is erroneous for two reasons. First, the name of the company generally should not be mentioned when you are inviting people to a meeting anyway. Second, no business is ever saturated in any community. The fact that your friends may have already heard of your particular corporation doesn't mean they won't be interested. What is objectionable is being invited to a social event or an intimate dinner with friends that is really a recruitment meeting. Deception or curiosity meetings are in home business presentations in which the prospects are led to believe that they are merely going to dinner at a friend's home. When guests arrive, they are usually introduced to others in attendance who are sponsors of the host and perhaps another two or three couples who are prospects. Once the dinner is over, a formal presentation is given to illustrate the logarithmic growth of MLM. That's when the guests realize they've been had. This kind of meeting is a fraud right from the start. Most people with any integrity will refuse to recruit their friends using such deception, and those who are persuaded to do so usually fail. Throughout our travels in America, Asia, and Europe, we have met countless individuals who have refused for many years to consider any involvement in our industry because their initial exposure was based on a deception meeting. Fifth Mine The Office Meeting Another kind of meeting mine is the office meeting. Even though he was warned by his upline mentor, Richard Call, to never get involved in the office process, Mark ignored him and yielded to the temptation in his fifth month. By then, he was earning enough money to be able to afford the office. Mark often tells the following story to MLM groups I had become a big business man. I actually pronounce it business because it's such a joke. Big business men are important guys. We usually drive a Mercedes, wear $2,000 designer sport coats, flash a Rolex on our wrist, and carry a platinum American Express card. Above all else, we need a fancy office and high overhead expenses to prove our worth. In all seriousness, the very things we attempt to escape by entering network marketing are frequently the things our egos dictate we must have once we are successful. When I started earning over $15,000 a month, I decided, against my mentor's protests, that I needed to move my network marketing business to an office location. After all, with that kind of income, I felt it was time to begin conducting meetings in an environment where I had my own desk, secretary, fax machine, and conference room. So I found a beautiful space in the nicest office complex in Austin, Texas, and signed a six month lease. Then I hired a part time secretary to take all my important calls, and poof, I was a big businessman. Guess what happened? First, my closing ratio declined by almost 50%. Not only that, but I had a significant increase in no shows to my presentations. What telephone calls I did take were people complaining about the attitude problems and general incompetence of my secretary. So I had to spend time teaching her the fundamentals of telephone behavior. By the second month, no one I interviewed signed up, and the few I recruited in the first month were clamoring to hold their meetings in my office and refusing to do their own in home meetings. By the third month, I had moved my office back home. Here's what I learned Office meetings don't work nearly as effectively in our business as do in home presentations. When I went home, my closing ratios jumped right back into the 20% range, and my downline distributors were much happier doing their own in homes when I was again doing so. We realize that advising against offices will be unpopular with many of you who already have offices and approach business in this manner. But our objective isn't to have you love us. Our goal is to get you to the same kind of income we are earning without unnecessary costly overhead. However, if you choose to keep an office, at least do so knowing all the facts. 
First, renting an office cannot be duplicated by most people because of cost. Second, an office creates unnecessary overhead. Third, office meetings do not exemplify the freedom that you should enjoy as a network marketer. Office meetings cannot be duplicated. Most people have jobs rather than private offices and therefore do not have the slightest idea how to manage them. This causes havoc and unnecessary stress, which can impede one's productivity. Most people are too busy just learning the basics of MLM to have time to deal with running an office. In addition, not many people can afford an office. Neither of us could have afforded an office in our first few months in business and therefore would have never signed up had we been recruited in an office setting. Office space, even if you share it with other business people, is expensive anywhere in the world. Remember, we are in a business of duplication. If we can't afford to do business in an office, on a boat, or anywhere else, it probably will also be impossible for, or inaccessible to, the masses. Offices create unnecessary overhead. Perhaps one of the biggest strengths of network marketing is the lack of overhead. In our business, you can reap the benefits of being an entrepreneur without the expense of a franchise or a small business owner's operating costs. The beauty of this business is that you can do it from your living room. There's no need to invest thousands of dollars on employees and office space. So why waste money on totally unnecessary overhead when an office is not going to increase your productivity? Offices do not exemplify freedom. There are two major attractions to our industry, big money and free time. Prospects who come to an office interview will feel that, by joining your MLM organization, they will be tying themselves to an office. Hence, where is the freedom? If they duplicate your system, soon they will not only be fighting traffic during their commute, but will feel compelled to spend much of their time there. What's worse, their leaders will imitate the process. They will feel that their presentations, too, should be held in such a professional setting. By leasing an office, you will be implementing a trend in your downline that contradicts the essence of this industry, giving ordinary people the chance to enjoy freedom outside of the traditional business site. We have people in our downline who have succeeded through both hotel and office meetings, but none of them are earning half as much as we are. Regardless of how much you make, we encourage you, as we encourage them, to make your decisions based on what you want out of your business. Some distributors and some foreign cultures simply prefer the group office environment for motivational and social support. We understand these preferences and accept the fact that network marketers are their own bosses. But nothing is going to prevent us from advocating to every distributor in every country the systems that made us millions. Our intent is to give you all the facts so that you can make intelligent decisions for yourself while establishing your network marketing business. Sixth Mine, the Bar or Restaurant Meeting Another hazardous situation can be found in the bar or restaurant meeting. Recruiters can't expect to be successful by conducting their meetings in public places where there is no access to a VCR, no blackboard or dry erase whiteboard, and lots of distractions. You know, little distractions like a gang of drunken office workers singing songs or a sporting event blaring over multiple television sets. One of the most popular network marketing books, written a couple of decades ago during our industry's infancy, asserted that anyone could become wealthy by doing presentations on a bar napkin. But that's a lot of bunk. Trust us. There's nothing at all effective or professional about doing business in a restaurant or a bar, unless the bar has a bulletin board-sized napkin, a VCR for your personal use, and doesn't play music, sell alcohol, or entertain customers. The secret of network marketing is to introduce as many new people as possible to our business opportunity. The method you use to sponsor your prospects should be one that can be easily duplicated and, in turn, used effectively with their prospects. It takes a lot of focus to do this right. Given the choice, your best chance for success 
is by hosting a small group meeting in your home, where you have total control of the environment. Seventh Mine, The Other Guy's Place Another serious hazard is conducting your first recruiting meeting at the other guy's place. If possible, try to avoid recruiting at any prospect's home or office. It is ineffective in the same way a bar or restaurant is ineffective. Distractions. What's worse, you have zero control of the interview. A friend of your prospect happens to drop by or the phone rings and, poof, you've lost the continuity of your presentation. The child of the prospect runs into the living room crying with a scraped knee, and you've temporarily lost your prospect's attention. Some people looking at our business have even been known to create distractions on purpose once they know we're coming to their home. One prospect we attempted to recruit in his own home actually invited two friends over who had failed at other MLM ventures in order to distract us and give him good reasons to ignore the ideas we conveyed in our meeting. It is time-consuming to drive across town to someone else's home or office. Also, why bother with a one-on-one -on -one meeting when you could be doing a small group interview, perhaps accomplishing four to eight times the results? But sometimes, if prospects cannot be approached in any other way, meeting at their place is better than not showing them your business opportunity at all. Mark showed the business to Dennis Clifton at his home, and that was definitely a trip worth making. But whenever possible, strive to get the prospect into your own home presentations, which allows you to have the control necessary to have an effective meeting. And if won over, the prospect is much more likely to duplicate the process correctly. Eighth Mine Technology Even though new technological methods will become available in the future, those distributors who remain faithful to a simple recruiting system will prosper dramatically. Remember, if everyone can't easily duplicate your system, it won't lead to success. We know networkers who are using the Internet and email to recruit and train new distributors. But more than 75% of all baby boomers are not yet online. So why limit your market to less than 25% of the boomer population? Others have attempted to work with phone drops, automatic dialers, fax-on-demand systems, and other new technologies. Used in conjunction with telephone and face-to-face -face approaches, this shotgun recruiting can be effective. Using only one technology to follow up on leads is very limiting and, by itself, will not work. While you personally may experiment with a new technology as part of your shotgun approach, you don't want to make the mistake of conveying to your organization that this new addition is your primary system. Your people will feel they can only succeed if they purchase the same equipment that you use, but some won't be able to afford it. Above all else, remember this. We are in the distribution industry. We are paid directly as a result of the amount of products or number of services sold and used by our network. Doesn't it just make sense to distribute items and teach systems in a manner that is most easily learned by the general public and most easily duplicated by them? Stick with this rule and you will go far in your business. The key to successful meetings is duplication. We want you to understand why in-homes are so effective as well as how best to use your time during the presentation and training meetings. Remember, this is a book about how to avoid the circumstances that could cause you to quit in your first year of network marketing. We've conducted every type of meeting we just discussed and found each is substantially less effective than in-home VCR slash whiteboard presentations. Never do we tell students in our network marketing college course that the in-home meeting method is the only way to succeed. We are not absolutists. However, if you truly wish to survive your first year, we think you need to understand all the various meeting styles from the most effective to the least effective. In fact, we don't just want you to survive. We want you dramatically wealthy with all the time in the world to do what you want when you want to do it.
Having said that, now we want to share with you what we believe is the best and most easily duplicated process in network marketing today. The real key to successful meetings always revolves around the fundamental MLM principle of duplication. Any type of meeting that cannot be copied and taught by the least articulate and successful person in your group is ultimately doomed to failure and should be abandoned. Mark had been in the business for nearly four years when he experienced a graphic example of this principle. As he explains, I received a call from a very enthusiastic fellow named Barney, who called me from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, to inform me that he had personally sponsored more than 200 high-quality distributors, yet none of them had become successful. I asked him to describe a normal work week in his life so that I could try to figure out what he was doing wrong. His prospecting techniques were excellent, and his ability to get prospects to meetings was unparalleled. He had a much lower ratio of no-shows than I did. It was when Barney began describing his meetings that I figured out the problem. I'll present his explanation for you exactly as he described it to me. Mark, my wife and I have a Rolodex full of prominent people in the South Florida area. We were very successful in two businesses and recently sold them for several million dollars. After two years of fishing, we got bored and realized that we needed to be doing something productive. So we signed up in network marketing and began inviting our warm market, ten at a time, to two weekly meetings. We conducted our meetings on our 100-foot yacht. Our daughter is in one of the best sororities at the University of Florida, so we hired her this summer, along with three of her friends, to serve cocktails and hors d'oeuvres at each of our meetings. They last about two hours, during which time we cruise the harbor, play the company video, and then do the same whiteboard illustrations you teach. When we're done, we dock our boat and invite them to Saturday training. Barney went on to explain that sign-ups were not a problem. All or most of his family and friends were signing up, and many actually ordered more products than the initial startup kit. Yet only one of dozens of his frontline associates had ever signed up any other distributors. After listening carefully to Barney's story, I asked him one question. How many of your frontline distributors and prospects own a yacht? He laughed and said, None. He got the point. He immediately moved his meetings into his guest house, quit serving cocktails and hors d'oeuvres, and eventually succeeded in sponsoring other successful distributors. Sometimes when we are teaching our distributors a system for recruiting or training, we will unwittingly suggest some new technique, one we've heard about but haven't actually put into practice. That's when we seriously lead new recruits astray. Here's our rule of thumb. If you personally practice a new recruiting or training procedure and actually see it work to increase volumes for a full six months, then implement it and teach it to your downline. If you've merely heard a rumor that some new system has worked elsewhere, don't give it serious consideration or even repeat it to others until you've actually tried it. You want to keep the in-home meetings of your downline so consistent that any prospect could attend any meeting in any city and walk away with the same knowledge and information. That's how the leaders in the top companies have done it, and it's hard to argue with billions of dollars of success. Recruiting Meetings There are many ways to prospect people, and we certainly subscribe to the shotgun approach. Use ads, fishbowls, and contests. Use walking and talking, lifestyling, and the telephone. Use the mail as well as the computer. Use flyers and bulletin boards in every available public area. Give handouts and attend trade shows and franchise seminars. In fact, use every method available to meet prospects. But then adopt one specific meeting style in which to make your presentation. And don't change systems, especially during your first two years. The best meeting is the one in which every single detail, from location to closing comments, is easy to teach and emulate. Steve Sledge recalls doing presentations in his den with a room full of people and how his family handled his need for privacy. I asked my wife and kids not to interrupt my meetings. 
The problem was that when they were away from our home and returned to find me in the middle of a presentation, there was no way they could come in without passing through our den. So they became creative, removing the large screen in the master bathroom and climbing through the window. Time and again I saw my family laughing, smiling, and waving to me as they made their way into our home. All the while the prospects were oblivious to what was taking place behind them. Those are the fun moments on which we all look back, remembering how we built global international businesses right out of our homes. Begin recruiting in your own city. Ken Pontius, one of America's MLM legends and a dear friend, explains the importance of starting to build your business at home in your own city during your first year. The money, skills, and knowledge it takes to sponsor long-distance distributors can be debilitating for novices. Sometimes, when I remember the comedy of errors that comprised my first year in MLM, it's hard to fathom that, through perseverance, my wife Shirley and I now earn millions each year. I sponsored people who had no business being in our profession, nor did they even want to be involved. I just pushed and pushed with the tenacity of a bulldog, never considering for a moment that people need self-motivation to succeed in life. I sponsored people who lived in other states before I had the money or the knowledge to support them. For some reason, doing business at home, in my own city, just didn't occur to me initially. I drove miles to do meetings, only to be stood up. In one case, I drove 221 miles to conduct a presentation for a minister in Missouri who promised that he had a hotel meeting already booked and filled to capacity. One sweet little lady showed up thinking it was a square dance. She do do right on out. I could fill ten pages with all the reasons why I should have quit in my first year, but it only takes one sentence to tell you why you shouldn't. Network marketing is the only industry that allows common people to earn millions with a minimal investment and zero overhead, coupled with total time freedom and the joy of global travel. There are three magic words that worked for all of us who have made it to the pinnacle, and they'll work for you. Just don't quit. Meeting Times and Locations Because virtually everyone has a home, It is obviously the most logical place to conduct recruiting meetings. People frequently say to us, Sure, Mark and Renee, that's easy for you to say because you live in a proverbial mansion. Yes, but remember, we began in humble environments. Regardless of whether you live in an apartment, trailer, or house, always use your largest room for meetings. You must have three items, a television, a VCR, and a whiteboard or flip chart. Most everyone has two of the three already, but if you don't, borrow or buy them. As part of creating a simple, easily duplicated system, we suggest that you show a video and do your presentations using a dry erase whiteboard. During his first year, Mark signed up people from different ends of the spectrum, sponsoring a bank president who had recently been terminated at the same time he sponsored the wife of a painter. The former banker lived in a million-dollar home in the finest subdivision in Austin, Texas. The painter and his wife lived in a trailer. The banker quit in three months. The painter's wife today earns $6,000 a month and most likely will do so for the rest of her life. The quality of your home environment is not nearly as significant as your own enthusiasm. Read the previous sentence one more time. It is the essence of success in MLM. Don't serve any food at your meetings, but if you feel the need to provide something, make it a beverage, water, coffee, or iced tea. Ideally, you should conduct meetings on any weekday during regular work hours for one hour either side of noon. These hours are best because it allows your prospects to take an early or extended lunch. The next best meeting times are evenings. The least preferable times are during weekends. You want to create the impression that our industry is a truly legitimate business that is conducted during normal business hours. The ideal number of prospects per meeting is four to eight. Try to avoid doing one-on-one meetings. They are an ineffective use of your time. Of course, there is always the rare professional whom you might determine needs a private meeting, 
but as a rule, small group meetings are best. For information on the opening interview and presentation, we refer you to a comprehensive step-by-step -step chapter on the subject in our book, Power Multilevel Marketing. This provides more specific information on the points to cover while doing a business opportunity meeting by whatever name you call it, business presentation, business briefing, business interview, or private business reception. No-shows are normal. Always schedule twice as many prospects as you would like to attend your recruiting meetings. For example, if you want five, invite ten. It is normal to have 50% no-shows at these meetings. People will offer up the wildest excuses for not showing up at your business presentation. Jerry and Debbie Campisi of Boca Raton, Florida, recalling their early days of building their business, claim to have heard every excuse in the book. Here are just a few of the standouts. You won't believe it. My house caught on fire and burned to the ground. I lost everything I own, including your information. I feel really bad about missing your meeting. I had an accident on the way to our appointment. I can't believe I'm still alive. I had to go to the hospital, but I'm okay now. I want to wait a few weeks to get everything back to normal before we meet. And their favorite. I couldn't show up for our appointment because someone broke into my car and stole everything I had, including your starter package. It had your telephone number, so I couldn't even call you. I'm really glad you're calling me now. How about this one? I was so excited to meet with you until my husband came home. He told me that this was one of those pyramid schemes where they don't care about selling anything. It's just a front-end network deal, and all they want is your money. He wondered why in the world I would even be looking at something like this. Two weeks later, he signed up in another deal that truly fit his description. Everything he was telling his wife not to do, he did. Don't be surprised if you get outlandish excuses. In a follow-up phone conversation, a prospect's girlfriend offered this defense. Oh, I'm sorry, my boyfriend must have forgotten. It's his pet snake's birthday. He can't come to the phone right now because he's having a birthday party. Jerry said he tried to get a visual on that one, picturing the snake wearing his birthday hat and diving into the cake. The Campeses advise that whatever you do, don't buy into all the explanations that people offer. Successful entrepreneurs know that excuses are the nails that build houses of failure. After more than a decade with one company, Jerry and Debbie Campisi have the experience to know the truth of that statement. They have reached the top. Like us, they met and married in this business and are our close friends and travel companions throughout the United States, Europe, and Asia. We all enjoy working the business together and playing on the beaches of the world. We have seen many successful marriages between distributors in our industry. Network marketing is a haven for finding people of like minds, hearts, and bank accounts. There is a rumor floating around our industry that a case is now pending before the Supreme Court that stipulates that network marketers can no longer merely marry, but must also agree to a legal merger of their downlines, without the possibility of prenuptial restrictions. Of course, that is only a rumor. Training Meetings Another meeting that is critical for success is the training meeting. We have created a 180-minute video called Power Training that demonstrates exactly what we do, step by step, emphasizing what we consider the most important elements of successful training. However, there are a few philosophical issues we need to address related specifically to training. According to some studies, an individual with above-average intelligence retains approximately 15% of new material taught in the first hour of a meeting, approximately 10% in the second hour, and beyond that, less than 3%. We are convinced that providing a laundry list of facts and ideas in the first training session, or for that matter in any training session, is not only unnecessary, but a foolish waste of time. Why attempt to teach people important material when it has been scientifically proven that many of those folks are going to forget most of what you will present? 
Our entire training system is designed in such a way as to change subject matter every 50 minutes. That's based on the solid fact that the human attention span cannot remain focused on one subject matter for more than an hour without becoming saturated. Then the mind must rest before devouring a new subject. We've met distributors who conduct weekend marathon training sessions. Some leaders actually have bragged about the fact that their training is so intense and comprehensive that it takes as long as eight hours to complete. Sorry, folks, that's insane. The subject matter of training meetings. As the first step in training, we teach people to create two separate training modules of 50 minutes each on a Saturday morning from 10 o'clock a.m. until noon. We suggest that the first hour be a demonstration of how to complete and how to teach others to complete any application forms, distributor agreements, product orders, and other paperwork. This is the time to show them the products included in your starter package. How to use them and how to build a base of 10 customers. Introduce corporate literature as well as any brochures or magazine reprints that you want your downline to use. That process usually takes up the first module. The second half of the meeting should cover goal setting with a brief explanation of the compensation plan, how to build their 2,000 person warm list, and how to focus on the importance of the relationship when approaching family and friends about this incredible opportunity. At the end of the two hours, make four assignments to your new associates. One, go home and use the products in the starter package. Two, find ten solid customers among your close circle of family and friends. Three, set your goals in writing using the material provided. And four, Using the memory jogger provided, begin to create your warm list. Remember, those who are serious about their 2,000 person warm list and get their 10 customers are usually the ones who succeed. During their training, remind your new associates that even though today they are the students, next week they will be the teachers. This system is so simple to duplicate that they should feel at ease training their own new distributors the following week. Doing nothing more than what you have just done with them. Stress the importance of using your system without deviation. Unless you can reduce your training system to one page, it's too complicated. That may seem like a preposterous notion, but it works. We use a one page training format to get our new associates started, a 25 page getting started manual at training, and a comprehensive encyclopedia of network marketing. For serious business builders. But guess which one we fax first to out of town distributors who want to learn our system? The one page training format. And when we do, the unspoken objection we have to overcome in the minds of most prospects is this is too simple. It sounds too good to be true. We tell everyone that the system is simple, but the work is not easy. Ours is the most wonderful profession in the world because it makes the most sense. People shouldn't have to spend countless hours in a classroom learning complicated business models from an academic who usually doesn't even practice in the business world. People learn the most while in a participatory role, making errors, yet learning from each one. With new distributors, our objective should always be to quickly cut the umbilical cord and demand of them leadership and hard work. At whatever pace they choose to do the business. The sooner new distributors become self reliant and follow a simple success formula, the better. And we must constantly be reprogramming our prospects for success by pointing out how simple and easily duplicated our system truly is. Because if we don't, most people will walk away thinking, nobody can earn this kind of money sitting in their living room showing a video. But we did. And so did Mark's housekeeper. And with a simple, proven, easily duplicated strategy, so can everyone else who has a home, a television, and VCR. Keep training meetings simple and limit them to two hours, tops. Now, what about the trainees who go home, try the products, write out their goals, start putting together a warm list of several hundred people, find ten customers, and call you back ready to go? Those are the individuals, the ones you've been praying to meet, whom you bring in for a personal one on one strategy session. 
This is the moment when our profession changes from sifting through the numbers to forging strong business relationships. In this personal training session, you help lay out an action plan suited for each new associate. Discuss how to select and approach those with whom they would like to create lifetime business partnerships, and schedule a specific day for you to help with their first presentations. This second training meeting should take one to two hours and include specific techniques for contacting their top 25 people, sharing an audiovisual package that introduces them to our business, and setting appointments to meet with those interested, since that is what they are going to be doing next with their warm list. Product training is not necessary. You might notice that there's something conspicuously absent from our discussion of the training meetings. Those of you who represent a company with specific products probably are wondering why we've left out detailed product training. Our reason is this: it is totally unnecessary. Those individuals who feel a burning desire to learn about the ingredients in their personal care products, vitamins, pet food, or other consumable items, should do so on their own time, both by usage. And personal study, but be forewarned: distributors who are product experts seldom become the successful builders of huge international organizations. One of the significant facts which surfaced as we interviewed America's best distributors during the research for our last book was that not one placed their emphasis on teaching intricate details about products or services. Not one. We are perfectly aware of the fact that some people reading this book pride themselves in knowing the function of every single ingredient in every single product they distribute. Such folks probably are upset with us for this unfair stereotype. Hey, lighten up! We have consistently poked fun at ourselves and revealed numerous ridiculous mistakes of our own. The truth is this: in our profession. Those who truly wish to recruit dozens of frontline leaders over the years and build a really powerful international organization must focus on educating the multitudes about how to achieve wealth and independence. These have always been and will continue to be the most exciting products in our industry. At one point, both of us still building our own individual organizations. Decided to become experts on one of our hair products, so we could dazzle people with our wisdom. It didn't take long to memorize the process that scientists used to fractionate the mucopolysaccharides to the precise molecular size, so that they would stimulate the papilla of the hair follicles in order to vasodilate the capillaries to just the right blood flow in order to improve hair fitness. And when we proudly talked about that in meetings. Some of the doctors even rolled their eyes in confusion. That knowledge never allowed either of us to obtain one customer nor sign up one distributor, so we quit mentioning it. We replaced all that with an enthusiastic, "It worked for me, and maybe it will for you too. Why don't you try it?" Don't discuss products in training other than to provide a general understanding of the primary products or services. Then encourage the distributors to use them all and learn from personal consumption. Network marketing is about sharing products and services with family and friends based on your own personal excitement with the results. It is not an industry based on your wisdom of the intricate details of how the products work. Remember the example of telling your friends about a recent movie you've seen or a restaurant you've discovered. The products you distribute through MLM are no different. The eight meeting minds presented here are the obstacles to avoid in year one. There are certainly others, but these are the most damaging. Numerous would-be successful distributors have unwittingly failed as a direct result of hotel, office, and other public presentations. Remember, you are a professional in a major global enterprise. There is no greater favor you can do for your new partners than to expose them to a legitimate prospecting package and recruiting meeting for your company. So, above all else, keep control of the situation. Meetings, whether for recruiting or training purposes, should be kept short, simple, and easily duplicated. Do them in a private setting, preferably in your home. And attend larger gatherings only periodically, as you and your group feel the need for bonding, acknowledgement, or remotivation. 
You dictate the time and place of the meeting. You control everything about the first business presentation. And even more important, you control how your newest associates are trained. If you've been through training once and it was done right, you can teach it too. Maintain the attitude that you are offering your prospects an appointment with destiny. What other professionals can look a man or woman in the eye and tell them truthfully that it is possible to earn $20,000, $30,000, even $50,000 a month and more in less than half a decade, while enjoying total personal freedom? No one can but those of us in network marketing. New distributors should avoid all the meeting minds like the plague and utilize only those group meetings that offer an occasional means of bonding with other distributors and positive reinforcement to the system your group is using. Be proud of the industry you represent, and don't be afraid to conduct your own meetings. Summary Attending unnecessary meetings can become the stumbling blocks that lead to your demise in our industry. Large hotel meetings don't work unless used periodically as a supplement to regularly scheduled in-home presentations. Weekly hotel meetings are ineffective and not easily duplicated because they are expensive, create codependency, can be embarrassing because of no-shows, are not private, do not exemplify freedom, often create the illusion of saturation, and do not encourage personal development. Occasional hotel meetings are best used to bring the group together to hear an upline leader, provide awards, offer recognition, and create bonding. Most of your time should be invested in face-to-face -face prospecting, telephone calls, and in-home presentations. The church service, a regularly scheduled recruiting meeting in which frontline distributors are taught to bring guests to the leader's home, where he or she then does presentations for everyone, can lead to disaster, if continued long-term, by creating codependency. A deception meeting is a dinner party to which friends are invited, believing it to be a social gathering, only to find out that they are there for a briefing about network marketing. It's proper to create curiosity about network marketing when inviting people to your home for a business presentation, but it's never proper to deceive them about your intentions. It is not wise to use an office outside the home because, one, it cannot be duplicated for most people, two, it creates unnecessary overhead, three, it does not exemplify the freedom that you should enjoy as a network marketer. No one can expect to be successful by conducting recruiting meetings in any public place, such as a bar or restaurant, where there is no access to a VCR, no whiteboard, and a great many distractions. When possible, avoid conducting meetings at your prospect's home or office because you have no control over the circumstances. High-tech recruiting methods, such as using the Internet, email, phone drops, automatic dialers, and fax on demand, can be effective when used with other approaches. But using only one technology is a very limiting system that cannot be easily duplicated. Successful meetings revolve around the fundamental MLM principle of duplication. Any meeting that cannot be replicated by the least articulate and successful person in your downline is ultimately doomed to failure. When beginning your business, start by recruiting in your own city. When doing a recruiting meeting, the quality of your environment is a fraction as significant as your enthusiasm. Convey the impression that network marketing is a truly legitimate business conducted during normal business hours. Expect about 50% of the people you invite to meetings will not attend, even after promising to do so. As the first step in training, we recommend that you set aside two hours each week on Saturday mornings to teach a small group of your newest distributors the basics of how to do our business. Following the first step training, set up a one-on-one -on -one personal strategy session with any frontline associate who completes your assignments. 
Product details should not be a significant part of your training because networking is a business of sharing of products with family and friends based on personal excitement and results, not based on a technical knowledge of ingredients or services. Meetings, whether for recruiting or training purposes, should be kept short, simple, and easily duplicated.